Hi everyone, my name is Margarita. I'm just going to be doing a little test. I just want to check that you can all hear me. If you could reply in the questions box, that would be great. Great, so welcome to today's webinar titled The Me Too Movement and Workplace Sexual Harassment. So just some housekeeping before we begin. If you are experiencing any audio difficulties during the presentation, please let us know via the questions box. You will also have the opportunity to submit written questions and questions will be viewable by all attendees. Fran will attempt to address all the questions either during the course of the webinar or at the very end. Today's presentation will be delivered by Special Counsel Fran Keyes. Fran has extensive experience in discrimination law, general protections, bullying and harassment, restraint of trade and confidentiality clauses, workers' compensation, institutional abuse, and public liability. Without further ado, I will hand over to Fran. Thank you, and thank you everybody for attending today. Um, I'm going to, there's actually a fair bit of material to cover and I've tried to um, not overwhelm you with the content um, because it can get a, a bit overwhelming, particularly when we've got different um, legislation that is largely the same but different in um, some relevant ways, which is probably why all of us lawyers continue to be required and um, provide some some help to clients because things are always a little bit tricky and never quite as they seem with um, the, the legislation. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about is the the issue of sexual harassment which of course um, is relevant to or can be relevant to any workplace but there's some particular nuances and um, issues that arise when sexual harassment um, potentially sexual harassment is said to occur within the context of, of churches or ministries or Christian workplaces. So um, I'm going to be speaking predominantly about cases that um, aren't about um, Christian workplaces because for well I guess for good um, we'll take this as a, as a, as a positive but there um, are very few decisions in fact um, no relevant decisions in in the recent past which where um, ministers or church uh, environments have been accused of it obviously or have had to defend sexual harassment um, allegations. <clears throat> of course, the focus for for churches at the moment is the um, royal um, commissions into um, that have affected them and have, have required you to put extensive um, work and consideration into sexual abuse allegations and um, all of that comes with that. So. I think what we'll do is, if you can bear with me, I think I will be, well, I, I've tried to do the paper such that if the if a question you've got that's burning in your mind now, um, it will, and you haven't heard me speak about it, I'm sure it will come up within the paper. So unless there's some um, something that you really wish to be answered, um, it's probably best you take a couple of notes. And as I go through the paper, if I haven't answered them, then you won't need to ask them. But of course, if I haven't answered them, please feel free to do that at the end and I'll make sure there's enough time. Okay, so what I'm, it's, what I'll be talking about is the legal context of sexual harassment, so the governing legislation, the context and examples of sexual harassment, definition sections, and importantly, how courts have interpreted the elements of sexual harassment in a workplace context. We'll look at the issue of liability. We'll also look at what um, awards or monetary awards are being um, made by courts in terms of sexual harassment claims. And then importantly, some of the preventative measures that should be implemented um, so that these claims hopefully won't eventuate, or if they do, there's a, a proper way that we that they can be handled or identified and also handled, and um, the complaint handling process. Okay, there's two legislative schemes that are relevant to sexual harassment, the Sex Discrimination Act, which is the Commonwealth Act, and the Anti-Discrimination Act, which is the Queensland Act. 
There's also general protections provisions in the Fair Work Act, um, which has been interpreted to include sexual harassment. However, there's an absence of clear legislative guidance when pursuing a, a sexual harassment claim in this context. Courts have recognised that sexual harassment is a form of sex discrimination which is prohibited under Section 351 of the Fair Work Act. Um, but for the purposes of the paper today, I will be concentrating on sexual harassment under the Commonwealth and the Queensland Discrimination Acts. Okay, so some example of sexual harassment. The Australian Human Rights Commission gives some examples of sexual harassment, which are set out on the slide. Um, I'll let you read them, but things like um, emails and texts or asking intrusive questions about someone's personal life, making promises in return for sexual favours, which um, uh, which can be, is uh, the defence often to those sorts of things is I was only joking. But in this day and age of political political correctness, it just doesn't, it doesn't, it's not going to hold, um, it's not going to have any water to it. I guess, um, and there's a number of other things here that I've raised which are fairly self-explanatory, um, the important thing to be aware of is, I guess what I say to my clients is how would you interpret this behaviour if it was happening to your wife or your daughter or your son or your husband? Um, it really is um, a test of, you know, what, what, you know, when you look at something and you look at the circumstances, do, does it feel right? Does it sound right? It really is as simple as that, um, which also means that you just have to be very careful about what you say and what you do because it can be construed incorrectly. So just being having uh, a more of an awareness about how your behaviour or other behaviour, so behaviour of other employees can be interpreted can help be a really useful guiding principle um, for workplaces. And obviously, workplaces are different from the home or amongst friends, but there is a higher duty really um, on employers within a workplace as to how they should behave because the legislation is there now um, and, it, it, and um, it's now being interpreted by the courts much more, um, let's just say, uh, much more, not harshly, that's not the word, but the courts are actually looking at this type of behaviour and um, there is more of a likelihood that the courts will be interpreting it on the, or err on the side of that's not, that doesn't feel right and it's not right that that occurred. So just keep that in, in mind. Okay, so where has this come from? It's come from the, the Me Too movement. So we're, I'm not sure if everyone is aware, but it was actually founded in 2006 to help survivors of sexual violence, particularly black women and girls and other young women of colour from low wealth communities find pathways to healing. Of course, we're, most of us are aware of the movement spreading virally back in October 2017 as a hashtag of social media in an, in an attempt to demonstrate the widespread prevalence of sexual assault and harassment, especially in the workplace. This followed sexual abuse allegations against Harvey Weinstein and a number of high profile celebrities have joined the movement, including Gwyneth Paltrow, Ashley Judd, Jennifer Lawrence, Uma Thurman and many more others. Okay, sexual harassment, it's defined in the Sex Discrimination Act um, as, as occurring when the person in circumstances in which a reasonable person having regard to the circumstances would have anticipated the possibility that the person harassed would be offended, humiliated or intimidated. Um, the thing to keep in mind here is that it really comes down to um, the words having regard to all the circumstances, the words reasonable person and anticipation. So is there an anticipation that that person that is potentially being harassed could be offended, humiliated or intimidated? Then there's the um, also making an unwelcome sexual advance or an unwelcome request for sexual favours or engages in other unwelcome conduct of a sexual nature. 
And conduct of a sexual nature actually includes making a statement of a sexual nature to a person or in the presence of a person where the statement is made in oral or orally or in writing. Okay, so the Queensland legislation actually, which is up on, on the screen, narrows the definition somewhat. It actually um, states in section 19 that sexual harassment happens where a person with the intention of offending, humiliating or intimidating the other person, or in circumstances, so you can see some of the similar words here, in circumstances where a reasonable person would have anticipated the possibility the other person would be offended, humiliated or intimidated by the conduct. And then it lists sub A, B, C and D. So again, the important questions here are with the intention of offending. So that's that's important to, to, um, to highlight with you. I'm going to look at, um, so we've got some case examples here with respect to some of the, the main things that we need to be looking at or what the courts are going to be interested in. What is unwelcome conduct in both the both legislations. So unwelcome conduct in the context of the federal legislation has been held to refer to conduct which was not solicited or solicited or invited by the employee and was considered undesirable or offensive. Okay. I'm going to look at the case study Aldridge and, and Booth. So in this case, um, the facts were that a teenage girl was subjected to inappropriate physical interactions by her employer, which she engaged with thinking it to be a tariff, a tariff which she had to pay to remain in employment. Um, the court emphasised the extremely vulnerable position that she was in. Um, and in particular, the fact that she continued to endure this behaviour because she was she feared losing her job and they awarded compensation. Now, that was quite some years ago. So back then it was $7,000 in compensation. Today it would be significantly more, obviously, since we've had Royal Commissions of Inquiry, since the spotlight is clearly on vulnerable people, um, you could... The, if that were to happen in this day and age, the damages would be substantially higher. Okay, conduct of a sexual nature. Usually this is not in contention because the sexual nature of a complaint is pretty obvious. Uh, so courts have interpreted these words to be uh, fairly broadly um, in, in the context of all surrounding circumstances. So what courts have found really is that conduct which is not inherently sexual um sorry they're looking at the pattern of the actual sexual behavior so they look at it in the context of of all of the circumstances of the case you probably hear that time and time again from your lawyers it depends on the circumstances i can't give you um, a definitive advice about something until i ask you a number of questions um, then i'll ask you some more questions until i can really understand the context in, in which this has happened um, and then lawyers can give advice okay in terms of a case which is <coughs> shields and james so the, magistrate, the federal magistrate court found that flicking rubber bands at a co-worker's worker's legs constituted conduct of a sexual nature because it was a part of a pattern of sexual behaviour. So it wasn't the only thing that was done. There were other things as well which taken together um, amounted to a pattern of sexual behaviour. Courts have also found that a co-worker's declaration of love will be considered conduct of a sexual nature. So this is a bit uh, of an interesting case where um, when the defendant or the respondent was um, giving evidence about you know, in, in his defence, he said, look, you know, I was just, um, I, I was just really keen on her and I just wanted to express that to her. Uh, I didn't mean for her to feel um, anything inappropriate, but it was found that, you know, and he'd been expressing this particular co-worker had been declaring his love for her to others as well. And, you um, 
she the, the error that he made as well was that he wanted he said that he wanted to speak to her alone at his house and the court found that the combination of all of this behavior and and comments to her and particularly the request to spend time with her at home constituted conduct of a sexual nature in in the scheme of things okay so we're looking at the words reasonable person so Section 28A, when it defines sexual harassment, requires that a reasonable person must have anticipated that the harassed person would be offended, humiliated or intimidated. So the question here is whether a reasonable person um, would feel that the complainant's reaction to the behaviour was understandable in the circumstances. So the case of Horman and Distribution Group, the, a woman was subject to sexual harassment in the a form of inappropriate language. Um, and there was also some inappropriate touching and the court found that a reasonable person in the woman's position would have been offended, humiliated or int intimidated by the actions. Now, this all might seem fairly obvious to you um, and that's good if it does, um, but I guess something to keep in mind is that when things are happening within a workplace and generally speaking people spend more time at work than with anybody outside the workplace friendships can develop strong friendships and relationships can develop which sometimes spill out into um, personal time outside of the workplace what we really need to keep at the forefront of our minds is that it is it is a workplace and your behavior to friends in the workplace really needs to be considered in the context of of um, risk so you just need to be putting your work cap on when you're talking to colleagues and when you're seeing relations um, taking place or discussions or conversations taking place amongst you within the workplace and if it seems that it's not right um, a quiet conversation with that person is um, something you, you might want to think about don't do it in front of everybody but you know, it's, it's incumbent on all of us to be just a, aware of the, the significant um, obligations that we all do have in, in the workplace that um, can sometimes just go wrong. So um, just keep that in mind. All right, where are we up to? Okay, so the court will also take into account the exi existence or absence of a meaningful friendship. Okay, so the courts, now this is back in 2001, we're looking at this case. Um, I think it might be on the next slide, maybe not. Shield Smith. Uh, yes, Smith, good. Um, so back in 2001, there was a case where um, a company manager found, was found to have sexually harassed a co-worker on three occasions, including approaching her when she was on the phone and proceeding to massage, massage her shoulders. The court observed there that whether the action is compassionate or reprehensible will depend on the overall context in each case. It, it, it emphasised that the context of the case didn't involve an action between friends, rather it was a middle-aged male employer to a young female employee, he, employee who had recently just started working there. Um, so what we're looking at is whether a reasonable person would have anticipated there was a possibility, that the, a possibility that the woman would have found this action offensive, humiliating and intimidating. Again, this case, it's, it's hard to I'm going to put it another way. There's not a lot of sexual discrimination cases out there. Generally speaking, the reason why is because people always can question, a lot of people question the whether or not the what is happening to them really is um, sexual harassment and they, they want to keep their job. Um, they lots, lots and lots of different reasons. There's jokes in the workplace or everyone knows that this person doesn't really mean it, etc, etc. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that we shouldn't be vigilant in the workplace about things that don't seem to be right. Um, 
The other thing to keep in mind is there are some relevant decisions as well, particularly that have come down in the in the last um, year or so, which indicates that what we need to be looking at also is the relevant community standard. So the community standard is significantly higher since we've had um, rural commissions into um, institutional child abuse, particularly focusing on obviously the church. So for church workers and, and church institutions, the focus and the spotlight very much in 2019 is on what happens within those workplaces. So you've got it coming from you each way, from every which way. Um, not only, I, I, I did give a webinar, I think a couple, it was about a couple of months ago, a couple of you on this list did listen to it. Um, but in that in that particular webinar, I was giving a presentation on psychological distress um, of church workers within their workplaces. The reason I was raising that is because one thing that hasn't really been addressed um, so much is the impact of um, church, churches on churches who obviously um, are focused on giving pastoral care and looking after people um, as their core work, including in their co-workers as well. But when you're looking at budgetary restraints and all sorts of other issues which impact on the ability of, of pastoral people to be giving, to be doing their job properly, um, it doesn't leave much time for really considering um, policies and, um, and having um, um, particular um, having things set out very clearly as to what is appropriate and what isn't appropriate in terms of um, of policies, but also time spent meeting and and having chats to other employees about you know the difficulties involved with um, doing your job as a church in in a church um, workplace. So it's not an easy time to be at work, um, and that also includes within a Christian um, organisation, it's it's really hard. I think my clients, as an employment lawyer, I get people coming to me that are employees as well as employers that are consistently telling me the same story that um, they're more work, oh, they're, they're worked harder than they've ever been working, um, not because anyone's particularly specifically driving them to do that, or to work those hours, but um, it is just the reality of a modern workplace in circumstances where there's so many things that you have to um, have around you in terms of checks and balances, and there's so many things that um, you need to be doing right, otherwise there's risks surrounded with your particular activity. So I hear you and um, I, I understand that um, it's, 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 it's difficult enough to be, to be doing what your job within workplaces and potentially some constraints or um, lack of um, sort of a real understanding about how to fix things such as there's not enough people to do the job. Um, that's very common. You're not alone. Um, and I think and I'm going to continue to talk about the Act now, the two Acts, but the important thing to keep in mind is really it's as simple as if you're seeing behaviour in the workplace that doesn't fit or sit well with you, um, then there, then it's, there's probably something that isn't quite right. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is that sometimes people act or their behaviour um, starts to, it can change. So people can do all sorts of things or behave in all sorts of ways that are unusual due to other things happening in their life. So it not, might, there might, not, might be something behind the unusual behaviour, which could, if treated, actually fix it. So there's a whole other minefield in terms of, you know, what is the cause behind someone acting potentially inappropriately at work? Is it because they're stressed? Is it because something's going on at home? Is there something there that you can have a quiet word with them, like, are you okay, which will start you know, putting in some 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 risk mitigations for you as well as a workplace, rather than simply ignoring it. Coming up to a person and having that conversation can really be a, a simple way to 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 start um, something going in the right direction as opposed to the wrong direction. All right. So we've talked about that. 
So again, um, the single incidents. You can have a one-off incident that will amount to sexual harassment, um, and you know it, if it's if it's capable of including. So if there's one single action, um, and there's not going to be a repeated course of action, uh, it can still be enough um, to to get to get a, a complainant over the line. So obviously, again, it depends on the nature of that particular incident. But just because it's a one-off doesn't mean there's a protection from the courts. Okay, so we're looking at um, liability. Who is liable for um, a sexual harassment that takes place in the workplace? So this section 28B of the Sex Discrimination Act looks at um, a variety of employment relationships, which includes the obvious one, which is the employer-employee. It also includes a prospective employee. So be careful about what's said in interviews, for example. You, it's, you can't just have a joke with someone potentially and, and um, expect that they might have the same sense of humour as you. You need to be careful um, from the commencement including the interview process um, as to questions that you put to potential employees. Uh, obviously between employees, employees and co-workers, um, commission ag agents, contract workers as well. So it does affect uh, a whole myriad of relationships connected to a workplace. So both um, the person who, is, who subjects another person to sexual harassment but also the employer organisation can be held liable for um, compensation if sexual harassment is proven. So personal liability. So again, you can be personally liable um, for your own acts of sexual harassment or any victimisation or if you've actually been involved in or turned a blind eye to someone else sexually harassing another person within the workplace. That's called accessorial um, liability. So vicarious liability. So employers will be held liable where sexual harassment takes place and they've been aware of it and they haven't taken reasonable steps to prevent it happening. So merely turning a blind eye is not a, a defence to a, a sexual harassment. Again, one of the things that a court will be looking at, but not the only one, but one of the thing that one of the matters which courts will be looking at is what policies that you have. But it's not simply, it's not as enough of a protection for employers to point to policies that they have. Uh, an employer would also need to be showing that those policies are being distributed to staff and there's also training are offered and we'd need to see that there is a, um, a record of employees attending that training. Even if, usually once a year, it's good to have a refresher and uh, it's important for employer organisations to have a some sort of a documented um, approach to making sure that they can prove that, number one, they have a policy, number two, that it's important enough for them to actually distribute and raise awareness of it to their employees. All right, so um, where are we? Stu versus or STU and JKL. Again, um, the question was reasonable steps and the court rejected that reasonable steps were taken in relation to um, this particular matter. Um, it's quite a it's quite a, a full on case actually. I'm just wondering if I've kept um, a copy of the facts of this, but it's um, you you would read it and you would think um, that these sorts of things don't happen, but they unfortunately do. Just seeing if I've kept a copy of that. Perhaps not. Um, but in that case, in 2017, an award of damages um, was made, uh, including the against the employer, where um, in the vicinity of three hundred and thirteen thousand dollars. So, um, and again, the particular circumstances there was that 
merely um, having policies in existence aren't sufficient. There needs to be steps taken to actually inform workers of their legal obligations and provide um, education um, to ensure compliance. Um, that's an equally important step in the process rather than, than just um, relying on policies because most employment places have policies. I did want to make a point though simply not having policies doesn't mean that that's the end of it for you because courts also recognize that um that, that it depends on um how many you know how many employees are within are being employed within the organization and what support mechanisms are around that um so the court does look at all of particular circumstances of the case. Just because there's no policies doesn't mean that um, you wouldn't be able to defend um, a, a sexual harassment claim. All right. All right, so accessorial liability. Employers can be held liable under the Commonwealth Act as well if they caused, instructed, induced, aided, or permitted an individual to perform an unlawful act. So um, again, this so liability will arise where an employer either knew or had reasonable grounds to believe that the complainant was at risk of sex, or had simply been willfully blind or reckless in known circumstances where the risk was real and possible. So again, you can see the common thread coming through here. Um, there's going to be liability for employers if sexual harassment is found to be taking place um, where there's an awareness that there could be a, a real risk that sexual harassment is occurring and that no reasonable steps are being taken to reduce or eliminate that risk. So and another important um, issue to raise is victimisation. So if it, it actually prohibits um, a person being victimised um, if they're connected in, in any way um, to a complaint. So victimisation means that um, where a person is being subjected to his or her detriment, um, as a result of lodging a complaint under the Sexual Discrimination Act, or if they're providing information or documents to the Commission or attending a concilia uh, conciliation conference um, as a witness for a complainant. So it just is a protective measure that um, you cannot, or you risk a possible victimisation um, complaint if you um, take any actions that could be seen as um, being detrimental to a person who is providing support or assistance to a person who is making a sexual discrimination complaint. For example, don't that, that person misses out on a promotion or that person's hours are reduced when they've been significant, you know, they've been significantly higher for the last two years, for example. So it's usually fairly obvious what that what that will mean. So again, under the um, Discrimination Act, courts will be looking to compare the position that the complainant might have been in had the conduct not taken place and the position where what, that the complainant was placed in as a result of the conduct. So, you know, that's, that's fairly self-explanatory. Um, if the person I mean, again, it depends a whole lot on what's happening in that particular person's world, I guess, which is where potentially medical evidence can come up as well. For example, there might be other, you might be aware of other issues and other um, situations that are going on in the complainant's life that may also be relevant, um, that should also be taken into account if you are defending a sexual harassment claim. Um, Again, it depends on the circumstances. As I said to you before, the courts have demonstrated a very sharp shift in favour of complainants in their compensation awards. So, and that's because of the heightened awareness of, you know, what sexual harassment is, uh, a higher 
um, owners and expectation that is being accorded to um, employers um, and understanding also of the damage that is caused to people when they suffer this sort of harassment within the workplace rather than it just being you know what's wrong with what's wrong with that person can't they take a joke that's not the prevailing attitude anymore the prevailing attitude is that's not right and it's not funny so in this particular case of Richardson the courts drew a comparison between the principles governing damage awarded for loss suffered by victims of workplace bullying and other harassment um, which and instances which lack a sexual as, um, element and also sexual harassment. It was noted in both of these types of cases that the victim could suffer psychological injuries and distress. So again, um, in, it's becoming something that the courts have a little bit more understanding and the medical profession has more of an understanding of. It used to be the prevailing um, sort of uh, attitude that a sexual harassment wasn't as serious as a bullying because it's all, um, a, a, it's about degrees. But the understanding now from the, the evidence is that even one instance of sexual harassment, depending on the circumstances and depending on the person who's it's subjected to it, can have a catastrophic event, um, um, impact on their psychological state. So it's not the poor party to, as compared to a bullying case, because it can be just as serious. So in this case, um, the original award of damages was $18,000 and it was considered um, manifestly inadequate. And you can see there that there was an increase to $130,000. So that's enormous, which um, was awarded in relation to the physical psychological and other non-economic loss. So when they're talking about non-economic loss, they're talking about pain, humiliation, distress. And that's 2014. Okay. Here's a more recent decision of QCAT. This is in of Green and State of Queensland. So this case involved a prank played on the complainant in which he was led to believe he was to clean up an area where two co-workers had previously had intercourse in. He subsequently suffered acute anxiety and PTSD which prevented his return to work. QCAT found that his symptoms were genuine and awarded $70,000 in damages for non-financial loss. Non-financial loss means again pain, hurt, humiliation, distress. It was noted here um, that the awards are unlikely to be given in cases where there is no recognisable personal injury. So what that means is similar to workers' compensation, there is a higher bar, there's a higher onus, it's more difficult to, um, to get up or to prove damage in a psychological injury case. In a psychological injury case, you really need to have very robust, robust evidence that a psychological injury has occurred, uh, that it's significant and that it took place, um, sorry, and that it eventuated um, due to the sexual harassment uh, or whatever it is. Now, there could be other elements or other items that are relevant to this person's um, decompensation or this person's psychiatric injury. And again, that's a question of evidence. There could be other things going on in that person's life. So if this ever went, if any of these cases ever went to court, then the solicitors would be asking for copies of the medical files to see what else was going on because it could there could be other the factors that need to be taken into account and um, that sort of all gets um, considered by the courts in determining one whether sexual harassment took place number two um, was it the sexual harassment that largely is responsible for the psychiatric breakdown or psychiatric injury um, and then if there are other factors what how much of the that how much is related to the sexual harassment part of the claim so that's all the, the legal speak which we don't need to be too worried about but um, it just really um, the importance of that case is to show the the way that the courts are leaning, which is heavily towards ex accepting that sexual harassment is a real and um, important um, risk uh, to mitigate against.
in uh, the context of a workplace and to also basically is is considered to be reprehensible conduct and and as such um, could be uh, an employee could be to, to be found to be liable for that so there's other potential causes of action as well that an employee could be exposed to which includes breach of an employment contract um, so depending again uh, most con employment contracts will have um, will have clauses in there about um, safety uh, and the importance of um, you know particular obligations in the context of the employment uh, also there are even if it's not specified in a contract of employment there is certainly an implied um, obligation on an employer to ensure the um, that the employee is safe within the workplace. There's also possible claims in tort, like in negligence for breach of duty of care, because there is an obligation in tort for an employer to actually take um, care for the safety and health of their employees. There's also legislation which um, could uh, protect or could, could be adversely constructed against or interpreted against an employer um, such that a criminal offence could be um, could be a possibility um, but usually what we'll see more out of because the legislation is a little bit easier to to follow and um, the the proof is uh, sorry the cases are showing that courts are certainly interested and open to um, findings in relation to oh is there no sound? No, no, just this one. Oh, tort. Um, a, a tort is a an action in negligence as opposed to an action in contract. Sorry, I've only just seen your questions coming up. Yeah. Um, what's this question say here? Hold on. Oh, yes, I think I've answered the next one. So someone's asked what is tort. It's basically an action in negligence as opposed to um, a, um, an action um, in contract or a, a legislative um, action. Does that make sense? Um, so the tort is whether or not someone's been uh, can be interpreted as um, breaching a tort is largely defined by how the courts consider um, an action in negligence whether or not um, an employer has uh, met um, or sorry an employee has met the the terms and conditions required to bring an action in negligence so a tort is like negligence I've said there's another question here about policies may so do you mean even though there are no policies may this so no policies mean that you can still be um, have a sexual harassment claim I think I've answered that one no just because you don't have policies doesn't mean that you're going to be um, found guilty of sexual harassment it depends on the circumstances it depends how big the organization is certainly if you have a fairly large organization with no policies you're going to be more likely to be exposed um, if there are no policies then I think that employers in this day and age really not need to start thinking about it now a policy on sexual harassment does not mean a 20 page policy it could mean a one page policy it would take a lawyer probably an hour to put together a sexual harassment policy. So um, the simpler the better. All of my material that I send out to employers is simple. So if I can't, if if um, if the most junior person in the office can't understand it here, then it doesn't meet the test. And that's so that everyone understands clearly what what the expectations and the responsibilities are. So just keep that in mind. All right. Are we off the questions? Okay. Okay, some key legal principles is, so again, what is reasonable in the circumstances? Uh, have a look at the circumstances in their entirety. What is the, um, what is the interpretation that is most reasonable will be something the courts will be looking at. It's not really a... Uh, it's, it doesn't really get more complicated than that. 
And again, the important thing to keep in mind is the prevailing standards, community standards of the day. My rule, as I said to you, is what would you think is acceptable? Would you think that acceptable, so that conduct would be acceptable if it happened to your wife, daughter, son, husband? That's usually a good indicator. Standard of proof. Um, so the other thing I wanted to keep in mind is, sorry, again, I wanted to reinforce, be really careful. I know that friendships occur within workplaces. That's really important. It's important for your mental health as well. But you really do need to just keep in mind that the line can't really be blurred. You've got to just be very careful about your conduct and how it could possibly be interpreted. Also be aware of any signs that are coming, signs of behaviour that are coming from your employees that might be unusual, that might you might think, uh, you know, where is this coming from? Rather than just let it go, there might be something happening um, in that person's life and having the conversation early with them could really just um, get rid of the risk that could potentially happen. Okay, what, so I've got a question here. At what point should someone start to keep notes of events, conversations uh, from the very beginning? Okay, if something is happening, then it's just like if inappropriate emails or texts are being sent, um, you should really be taking notes um, that are contemporary, and they're called contemporaneous notes. If you've got notes, that will help that is evidence and it could prove um, the case. One thing though I, I'm going to say to you being in this field for so long is, and it depends on the, on the circumstances of course, but if something is happening which isn't right and it doesn't feel right and it's happening either to you or to somebody else, call it out. Don't spend all of your time making notes and, and, and um, and building up your evidence. Try and deal with it. If you can't deal with it, talk to someone that you can trust. It doesn't have to be your supervisor because, I mean, everyone has different relationships with um, within the workplace of trust. But um, if you try and take some steps um, or at least so, uh, some options are taking some steps to try and stop it because often a bully or someone who does that or potentially is sexually harassing you, um, will stop because they've been found out. It's like the old story of someone who steals from the church coffers that's been let to do it because, I mean, back in the old days, I've got some clients there who had older women that were looking after the monies from, um, from the parishioners and it was just too embarrassing to raise that with her. And so it, it continued and it got worse and worse and worse. So again, Taking some personal responsibility can go a long way. Now, some people can't because they're not strong enough. I'm not saying it's going to be the answer for everything, but sometimes you can fix things before they get more problematic. But, of course, it's always a complex situation. Again, if, you, if you've got some things going on in your workplace and you do have access to a lawyer, it's probably a good um, um, uh, point to actually, you know, raise the issue with somebody. Uh, again, so the answer is yes, if you are trying to stop things and they're not stopping, then you would take notes and of these conversations so that you've got some evidence of them. But again, I really, just for your own mental health, um, I, I always say to my clients, just try and work out a way to, to stop it or to point to that behaviour sooner rather than later to, to someone in authority who can help stop it because, of course, as soon as you mention it to um, either if it doesn't get resolved with the person that you trust, then at that point you go to someone who has some authority because then they're on notice about it too. And that's the very important documentary evidence that you will have because the defence to a lot of these claims are I did not know, nobody told me. And that's a really good defence to have if you haven't got any proof of it. So just a lot of the a lot of the advice that I end up giving people is actually pretty obvious. 
but you just haven't it's because i'm in this zone every day that i can point these things out um but sometimes it can really resolve itself to if you can very quickly if you have those difficult conversations early on with that particular staff member hey that's not on you you can't you know that's doesn't that's not right what you just did uh i don't think it, you know, i just didn't get a good sense from that that sort of stuff now you might also write an email uh, sorry write yourself a little note about the conversation that you had with this person so it's not misconstrued if it's said without anybody else around you so just again think about what the uh, you know a reasonable thing to do is now when we're looking at um let me just have a look and see what we've got here so standard of proof is usually um the balance of probability so what would when you're looking at all the facts did it occur or didn't it's not a criminal standard which is beyond reasonable doubt it's beyond it, it's it is simply um on the balance of probabilities if you look at it on balance what what do you think happened there's also got to be procedural fairness and substantive fairness um accorded to any investigation or any um inquiry within a workplace as to whether a particular um, action or um, event occurred you have to be mindful of both the complainant and the respondent um, you have a duty of care to both people within your organization to to do the right thing um, not only by the organization but also by those two people you have to give them you have to be procedurally and substantively fair okay we're almost there but I'm just Let's have a look and see what we've got. So this, uh, I've, this got a fair bit of media coverage, uh, coverage, this case. It's in December 2016. I'll let you have a read of those facts, but you can see um, what has happened here and the compensation awarded was $328,000. So this involved... Um, um, she, she had actually, so this obviously involved two co-workers and the award was quite a significant amount of damages, um, which is again showing how the courts are taking these actions very seriously. Again, the important um, element there was how distressed she was as a result and the extent of the psychological injury, which was found to be all as a result of this actual encounter as opposed to anything else going on in her life. Again, another case here, um, sexual comments, questions, etc., cetera, over, over a period of months. And let's see, hold on, and again, um the court made an, an award for non-financial damages and overall $102,000. So that's a QCAT decision in 2013. There's no way in, in the pre-2007-8 that you'd get any awards close to this sort of amount. So you can see which way the courts are going and taking it more seriously. Um, this is a 2009 decision. You can see here that the award is only $24,000, which included economic loss, uh, which is the obviously earnings, loss of earnings, as well as palm pain and humiliation. So that's not very much at all. Okay, we've got another question. Hold on. Yeah, there are. I haven't. I haven't got into the. Um, there's a question about volunteers. I think um, there. Sorry, there. There is a responsibility on employers to ensure that um, uh, that volunteers. Um, um, are, are being true well, sorry the legislative does uh, regime does include um, sexual harassment um, of volunteers as long as it happens within the workplace so we need to look at you know exactly what the volunteers are doing are they supposed to be there are they taking direction from the employer and if yes they're also protected oh you keep talking oh yeah okay I think Hold on. 
yeah, the the man in the woman's room. Yeah. There was an issue in that case. There's a case. So the, there's a question about the man in the woman's room, the co-worker. What? Um, why there was liability was held there was that the um, the it, the um, the argument was raised that um, it was outside the scope of the employer's duties to ensure safety um, of of this particular so of safety of co-workers um, at a an event that ha was happening outside work. The employer very much drew the, said that, sorry, the, the court said that it's clear that the responsibilities and, and um, in terms of safety are continue to remain on the employer when the event is happening at a work organised event. In circumstances also in this case where there had been some previous conduct involving this fellow um, and the employer was aware of um, his tendencies for amorous behaviour um, and so all of those circumstances were taken into account. It wasn't um, a one-off, um, unexpected uh, event that happened. So basically the court looked at all of the circumstances and made that decision based on the fact that the employer can't turn a blind eye and is, is supposed to be um, equally vigilant even um, at work functions. Okay, so we're looking at preventative measures. Again, they've got to go beyond procedures and training. There needs to be an element of, you know, what is reasonable and what is sensible apart from having policies and procedures. I'm just having a look at some of the questions. Hold on. There's a question about are we supposed to be educating volunteers as well? I would recommend yes. I think anyone that is providing um, any uh, assistance to the church should be included. Uh, that will certainly, because volunteers these days know their, the, I mean, there's a lot more understanding about um, their rights. So as they become more and more aware of it, there could be, um, there could be more they, they could actually take action. So I think it's better to include uh, those volunteers in any discussions about and policies about, um, you know, that you have in relation to workplaces. But I, I mean, it's a, whether or not, so I, I, I think, yes, in overall, I think you need to be um, including volunteers in any information sessions because they are very much involved within your workplaces. Uh, there's a question about how far back people can go. Um, generally speaking, you've got time periods in which to bring claims, um, but you can also, you, there's, a, there's a, usually a year, um, but it's fairly easy to get a, the court to accept um, extenuating circumstances such that you can bring, bring claims outside of that time. Uh, and of course, that the court would take into account the reasons why you haven't come forward and there might be a whole stack of reasons. So you just need to be um, mindful that the statutory limitations um, can be overcome at times, depending on the circumstances. All right, things to think about is your reputational damage. You know, as soon as um, the last thing you want is a court proceeding. So my view is stamp it out. If something comes up very quickly, rather than ignore it or pretend it doesn't exist, you've just got to get onto it. Um, because most of the time, there's a way to fix things. Most of the time there's a way to um, compensate or um, apologise without having li liability attached to that apology. There's usually a way that you can, uh, if things haven't gone well and you haven't potentially um, done what you all that you could um, as a reasonable employer, there, there are usually ways that you can come to a negotiated um, outcome 
or resolution with a staff member. It's better than going to court. The last thing you want is reputational damage when an award is given or when a claim, when a claim doesn't go your way. Harm to all, as soon as you've got any claim within an organisation with employees, it harms the organisation. It seems to suck the life out of it, of, of um, in a workplace when um, there's something going on that's quite serious. Uh, it's the usually the thing that everyone knows about, even though they're not supposed to know about it. People tend to find out. Uh, again, looking at create not just having policies and procedures but creating a culture where harassment is not tolerated it's better to call things out when they happen and when you see them have ad hoc discussions um, rather than yearly discussions potentially I mean if something's going on or something's not feeling right then managers need to take responsibility for that and step up again training can be offered in, in this regard too again um, I've spoken about the fact that size is important in terms of the expectations and what is considered reasonable. But again, um, if you've got a small organisation, for example, where um, sexual harassment or at least behaviour that is indicative of sexual harassment has been taking place um, for you know once or for a period of time, then it's not simply going to be a defence to say we were too small, we didn't need to worry about it. So we're looking again at size and structure, available resources, a history of harassment um, and any other relevant factors. Again, we need to take responsibility, all of us, um, in relation to taking steps. And importantly, if, if it comes to your attention that there's a complaint, then there needs to be procedures that are followed um, once the complaints are made because that's where the procedural fairness and the substantial fairness elements come into it and we need to make sure that they're followed. Five steps. Again, management support, implementing um, a policy, providing training, uh, encouraging appropriate conduct, so obviously lead from the top and creating a positive workplace environment where fe people feel that they can actually speak out. There's some information there about some important elements to a sexual harassment policy. Number five is, is interesting as well. What is, what is not sexual harassment that can be useful to, to um, put in place? And number 10 is important information where individuals can get help, advice or make a complaint. And then number 11, a brief summary of the options. Okay, so I'm just basically touched on this. The complaints handling process really is the subject of another webinar. Um, in, which includes the investigation process. There's a lot to think about and a lot to consider when you're going down that, that path. So again, there's decisions to be made around when to investigate a harassment, a sexual harassment. Um, you've got to look at your, your policies that are in place or the EBA. Um, you've got to look at um, you know, the termination of employment, if it's if that's anticipated due to mis serious misconduct. So if you've got someone who um, has has been engaged and potentially engaged in sexual harassment, you need to be looking at what possible consequences there are for that em employee and um, risks involved with potentially um, them suing you for unlawful dismissal. And then we've got obviously complaints of sexual harassment or bullying and breaches of work health and safety laws. Then when a complaint is received, you've got to assess how serious it is and when the response should be given and what should be the response. You've got to be responding in accordance with any enterprise um, agreements that stipulate what to do or internal procedures. And um, you have to be looking at it in terms of a proceed the procedural fairness principles. Uh, it's important to be properly proofing witnesses. Um, again, I can't insist more, much more than I've been saying that early settlement is so important for reputational risk. It's worth forking out more money at the beginning than spending money on lawyers to defend it, unless 
unless it's not true. So the important part of the process obviously is determining, getting all the information together and working out whether or not there really is um, something that needs to be investigated. And if there is, um, or if, there's, if it's obvious that there are some concerns, I mean, every step of the way, you've got to rethink, you've got to think about what your the appropriate response is and whether or not you should be trying to resolve it or comp um, compensating a person accordingly, getting a deed of release to say that in exchange for um, monetary compensation, we want you to um, sign a, a release so that you won't sue us. I mean, there's all sorts of things that, that are in that space. There's also um, private mediations that can be of assistance and um, other things to think about. So I've sort of rushed through that little bit at the end, but uh, is there any other questions that anyone's got? So I've gone over a little bit but I think I've answered all the questions on on the board there. If there's anything else that comes to mind um, or anything specifically that might be happening within your organisation that you have some concerns about, um, then please, I'm just having a look at one of the questions. Hold on a minute. Sorry, is that blanked out there? Oh, yeah, good. Hold on. Uh, there's a complex question which somebody has given which really can't be answered in the... Um, uh, very easily. Uh, in terms of what happens, a question there is what happens if a staff member wants to apologise or ask for forgiveness for something that has happened in the past um, to an individual but they're concerned about opening themselves up to charges. Again, it totally depends on what the particular circumstances are. Is that person still an employee? Uh, all sorts of things. There could also be some public liability exposure there as well. So again, that would depend on the particular circumstances of the of the case. So if there was anything specific you wanted to, to talk about, um, please let me know. Uh, there's an also whether or not an additional webinar is going to be done in respect of investigations, possibly, if that's something that people are, are wanting, that can possibly be done because that's quite a tricky pro process which does require another webinar. Okay, well, I'll, I'll let you, I'll, I will um, bid farewell, but thank you for your patience and I hope I've answered some of the questions that um, that, you, that, you, that were important to you. Uh, again, everything does depend on the facts and circumstances, which is, um, and they're usually tricky and they're usually um, very pertinent to the particular employer. So uh, it, it really, um, each, each thing does depend on itself, but just the key takeaways really are, there's so much to be said about having a conversation early on it can make everything go away and people when their behavior is picked up on at the beginning will often stop it because they just don't realize it um, some of them just don't realize the impact it has on others so just just keep that in mind but thank you very much um, and i really do appreciate your attendance today thanks for that fran um <clears throat> Just to let you know, there will be a replay of this webinar available and emailed to you after we conclude to watch at your leisure. We'll also have a copy of the PDF slides available on our website. So thank you for viewing the webinar today and we look forward to hosting you in the future.